Good morning, church. It is great to be together, even if it is by an online platform. We are so excited to worship and praise the Lord with you all this morning. But before we start the service, there's just a few things that I wanted to share with you and let you know. All of our weekly ministry programs like H2O, Sonic, and Root have been canceled for this week. But please keep checking our Facebook page and our website for updates as we hear further direction from the government. We do have some exciting news. Nicholas and Ashlyn LaMarche delivered a healthy baby boy named Dakota William Bobby LaMarche on April 2nd. I love that name. Anyway, we are so overjoyed for this precious family. Congrats to you all. And we also have some very difficult news to share with you. Many of you may know Ruth Campbell. Well, her mother passed away a few days ago, as did Brian Nix's father. Church family, please be in prayer for both of these families during this loss of their parents. Ruth and Brian, we trust and we know that God will carry you through this storm and give you the strength that you need our deepest sympathies, and please know your church family loves you dearly. Well, friends, we are about to begin our time of worship and praise, but before we do, I just wanted to encourage you that you can have a spirit-filled and purpose-driven life, even in times of uncertainty. We just need a renewed sense of hope, and that is where Jesus comes in. So as we sing together this morning, let's declare all that God has done for us, along with the blessings we have yet to see him do in our lives. Remember that in every season, in every circumstance, he is able to do more than we could ask or imagine when we trust in him with our present and our future. Amen. Let's praise and worship his name this morning. Story. I'll testify. 
depths of the sea creation revealing your majesty from the colors of fall to the fragrance of spring every creature unique in the song that it sings all You place the stars in the sky and you know the my name. You are the amazing guy. Oh, powerful, untamable, on strength we fall to our knees as we humbly proclaim. You are the amazing guy. Who has told every where it should go Thank you.
message listen closely to the exiled misunderstood or upside down this is your message of hope when problems come use them when enemies persecute you love them these struggles are a fire refining you into gold look around you are not forgotten you are not alone Challenge what is expected of you. This world is not your home. You are different. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Temple Baptist Church. We're so glad to have you join us online. If this is the first time that you, you know, you're new among us, we want to offer you a very special welcome. Thank you for sharing part of your day with us. And uh, we don't take that for granted, by the way. Well, what a difference a week can make. I mean, last weekend, uh, we had multiple services, hundreds of people gathered together to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. And then on Wednesday, the announcement is made for a stay-at-home order for the next 28 days. We go in this fast mode of trying to rearrange everything. And then late Thursday afternoon, we discover that uh, the stay-at-home order doesn't impact the church, uh, that we could still meet at 15%. I tell you, all these restrictions and changes can be confusing at times. Sometimes you feel like a uh, a little bit of a, like a yo-yo. So Lord willing, we are hoping to be able to gather uh, next Sunday uh, physically together. Uh, for those who are joining us, maybe that are new, we like to let people know right up front, you don't have to try to figure out who we are. We are a church on a mission. We try to keep the main thing, the main thing, and the main thing for us is to connect people to Jesus and to one another. One of the things that we know for sure, that a relationship with Jesus is a game changer. And we know from experience that life is better together. We were never designed to do life on our own. Now we're known for multiple things in our city as a church. We're, of course, we're known for our day camp, 40 years. You know, eight to 900 kids gather here all summer. We get to invest in them and pour into them. Uh, we get to partner with people like the Crisis Pe Pregnancy Center, NeighborLink, Into the Good Shepherd, Salvation Army, the homeless shelter run by the Vineyard. We get to pour tens of thousands of dollars into this city that we really love, where we're invested uh, in this city. And of course, then we have partners uh, literally around uh, the world. But one of the reputations that we have as a church 
is that we are a church who actually believes the Bible. We proclaim the Bible, uh, we preach the Bible, and every time we gather together, guaranteed we are gonna take some time and open it up and see what it has to say for us. Now I realize that some, maybe some of you that are tuned in this morning uh, are still trying to work through all this Jesus stuff, maybe aren't quite convinced about the Bible, and that's okay with us. You can bring your questions, you can bring your doubts, because we have a lot of confidence in the Bible and in the God who wrote of the Bible. So we invite you to be part of the journey that we're on. Well, the last two weeks, we took a break from our series to celebrate the Easter season, but we're going back into the series that we have entitled Called to be different. We're, we're not to live like everyone else. And so we're studying the book of 1 Peter, a book that was written by the Apostle Peter. Uh, Peter, you know that guy who said, I would never deny Jesus the day before Jesus was crucified? Well, we, you read his story, and three times in less than 24 hours, he denies Christ. Uh, he's the one who is known to be impulsive, that, uh, you know, foot and mouth disease. Uh, he's opinionated at times. He has anger issues at times, but he is a mover and a shaker of the early church. He helps, he has helped make the New Testament church what it is today. Tradition tells us that he was sentenced to be crucified, and he didn't, he didn't feel worthy enough to be crucified like Jesus, so he asked if he could be crucified uh, upside down. Now, what's so interesting about the book of 1 Peter is that it is packed with theological truths. They're not these high and mighty theological truths that we have a hard time to understand. No, deep theological truths that really impact our lives. And, and the book is also filled with just practical tips for living. Though the book was written 2,000 years ago, it's very relevant for us living in 2021. A tiny little book at the end of our Bibles, easy to skip over. And uh, we're going to continue that series. Uh, so if you have your Bibles, and I I hope you do. Would you turn to 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2, and we're going to pick it up at verse 4. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. If you have some kind of electronic device or Bible, you can turn there now. I'll also have it on the screen uh, behind me. Before we read, you know, I just wanted to say we often need encouragement. We need encouragement in our jobs. We need encouragement in our families. We need encouragement in our relationships, and especially we need it uh, in the Christian life. You know, being a follower of Jesus in a world that does not recognize him can sometimes be stressful. It can cause adversity. Sometimes it causes a little bit of suffering. And it's in those times that we most need encouragement from our brothers and our sisters. And this was especially true for early Christians, the early church. You know, a small uh, community of uh, believers spread all over the Roman Empire. That, and they were viewed with suspicion and hostility and so the, the early Christians, they, they just uh, often lived on messages of hope and encouragement. Now remember, the book is written to a group of believers who are being persecuted. And when I say persecuted, I don't mean somebody in the corner is kind of laughing and poking their fingers you know, at them. No, no, no. We're talking about the kind of persecution that tears families apart, you know, throws people in prison, and where people are killed. And so many of them were fleeing for their lives. And of course, the, the, the Roman Empire at the time is Nero. And of course, the best that we can say is that he was an unstable leader, crazy man. And so Peter wanted wants uh, these believers to experience the certainty of their salvation, not to have their faith shaken when life doesn't go the way that they want. He wants them to know that there is hope even when life is hard. Now this morning, the passage of scripture that we're going to be looking at is quite challenging because it was written in a different uh, time, a culture. You know, certain words uh, and terminologies uh, change over time. And at times it can be very hard to understand. Well, those are the kind of the verses that we have here this morning. Because the book was written 2,000 years ago, there are some word pictures that are painted for us that don't have quite the same significance for us living in 2021 as it did for those living, you know, 2,000 years ago. Uh, let me give you an illustration in the English language. We would have terms and phrases that maybe 500 years from now will be completely uh, different. Like, for instance, the phrase, barking up a tree. You know, 500 years from now, who knows what people might think that means. But for us, it just means like, you know, they're kind of going in the wrong direction. Like, they're barking up the wrong tree. That's not how you do it, you know, things. Or maybe the phrase, oh, we're not in Kansas anymore. 
And of course, that has nothing to do with being in the state of Kansas. That just means we're not home. We're, we're in, a, in a very unfamiliar area of life, right? What, what about, um, well, he's not playing with a full deck, you know, maybe he doesn't have all the information. Or the ball is in your court. It doesn't mean anything about basketball or um, tennis. It just means, like, it, like, it's up to you now. I I'm passing it over to you. It's your responsibility. What about, um, boy, he hit it out of the park. You know, we often think of that, of course, as baseball, but it often can refer to maybe someone gave a, a presentation, maybe someone wrote an exam, and they did an amazing job. And so we say, hey, he hit it out of the park. You know, 500 years from now, that may not have uh, the same meaning. Or what about um, uh, he struck out? Now, we often think of baseball, but, you know, someone could maybe make a presentation and, and they just did terrible on it with, oh, he struck out on that. Or what about from the cult classic movies of Terminator, I'll be back. Well, that means something completely different today maybe than what it will 500 years from now. So Peter's going to give us some word pictures uh, in this passage of Scripture. And for the Jewish culture, they would have been very familiar. But for us, it doesn't always have the same uh, significance. And, and though the book is very relevant uh, for us, it was written to Jewish Christians who had brought their Jewish culture uh, into this new Christian faith that they were experiencing. So with that, uh, let's read 1 Peter um, chapter 2, verses 4 through 10. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable are acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy." Let's pray. Father, again, we thank you um, for this opportunity to open up your word. I, I pray, God, that you would make these uh, verses come alive to us. Maybe we'd be able, to, uh, be able to relate and understand and know what we have in Christ and who you are. So, Lord, take our time. Bless it. Move in our lives, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, as we were reading through that par uh, passage, you might have thought, what in the world is Peter talking about? Well, he kind of gives uh, a couple word pictures. First of all, he says Jesus um, is like the cornerstone. Uh, he's also described as the living stone. Uh, believers, the word picture he gives there is that we are living stones. Not the living stone, but we are living stones. And then, of course, it gives this word picture of unbelievers, that they're disobedient believers. Now, in that opening verse, when it says, in verse 4 of uh, 2 Peter, it actually makes it, the statement is, as you come to him, the living stone. This is in Greek, is what they call a present participle, which means it's, it's an ongoing action. As you come to him, it's not a one-time thing. Like, you know, when you came to him at salvation. No, as you come to him, this living stone, like how you came to him yesterday, how you're going to come to him today, and how you're going to come to him tomorrow. It's, it's, a, it's a continuing action here. And it doesn't just start, I mean, it does start the day that you came to Christ, but it continues on. He says, as you come to him, the living stone. Who, who is this living stone? Well, it's the person who was rejected by humans, but chosen by God. Interesting term. That's a favorite word of Peter. He uses it multiple times, actually, in the next couple of verses. But he was chosen uh, by God. Chosen for what? To bear our sins, because uh, to cover our sins so we could have a forgiveness of sin. And because he did that, 
He is precious uh, to God. And then in verse 6, so we find out that Jesus is actually referred to as the living stone, but in verse 6, he's also called the cornerstone. Uh, the cornerstone, an essential part of a building, when, when the cornerstone is laid and it's not level, well, then it begins to impact the entire structure. If the cornerstone is not in the right place, then it could, you know, by even a couple inches or, or a couple feet, it really could have profound impacts. And, and so, but Uh, Peter is saying that Jesus is the cornerstone and you can actually build your life on him. And so as I was thinking about that, why would um, Peter refer to Jesus as the living stone? Uh, Why is he called the cornerstone? And kind of working through that, and I thought maybe, just maybe, um, there could be an explanation for that. And it's found back in Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. By the way, many of you will be familiar with this passage. Matthew chapter 16. Uh, The story um, takes place in a a city or in a town called Caesarea Philippi. I actually have a picture here. Caesarea uh, Philippi. A group of us were there actually about a year and a half ago right at this spot. And Jesus is having a conversation right here in Caesarea Philippi. Um, this is a place, by the way, that's uh, very sacred. Um, it's a religious area for the Canaanites, by the way, not for the Jewish people. In fact, the Jewish people would do everything they possibly can to stay away from a place like this. This was like Sin City. They would rather walk 20 extra miles around and avoid Caesarea Philippi. Uh, as I said, it's a religious area. This is where the, the temple for the god of Pan was built. This is where the Canaanites came to worship. And it's, it's very interesting that Jesus actually takes his disciples through this area uh, of Philippi. Um, this area, by the way, uh, underneath this uh, huge rock face, which is at the, uh, the base of, uh, I think it's Mount Hermon, um, it was told years ago that water used to gush right out of uh, that cave right there. It would gush out. And the historian uh, Josephus, a Jewish historian, said, there wa- quote, there wasn't a rope long enough to determine how deep uh, the spring was. And in Jesus' time, uh, lots of people believed that there was an underworld. Uh, under, you know, under the, the water, there was a, yeah, an underground world there. And some even thought maybe that's where hell was, uh, at the bottom of the sea. And so what we have here, this, uh, all this water would gush up, and uh, some people believe it provides about 25% of the Jordan River underneath uh, this mountain. And so it's at this place, uh, you can actually see where some of the statues would have been uh, in the mountain, carved in the mountain for the um, temple for uh, for the god of Pan. So, in verse 13, as I said, there's this conversation going on. It says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked the disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? He's referring to himself. Who do people say uh, that I am? And it says there, they replied, well, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Uh, Jesus wasn't interested really what people were saying. He's leading up to a really insightful question that he's about to ask, but he's asking, what's the talk out there? And of course, the disciples are very quick to say, oh, some are saying John the Baptist, some say Elijah, some say the prophets. Uh, Quite obvious, people recognize Jesus was different than everybody else. There's lots of conversation. Nobody knows who exactly he is, but he's not like the average person. And so there's obviously lots of conversations, lots of talk going on uh, behind the scenes. And so Jesus says, what are people saying? But but what about you, Jesus asks? What do you say, or who do you say that I am? And and, and, uh, Peter shouts out, well, you're the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus goes in to say, you did not figure this out on your own. Like, this has not been figured out by flesh and blood. The only way that you could know this, Peter, is that... God the Father revealed that uh, to you. And so then we come up to this uh, next statement, which is really a very famous statement. Verse 18, and I tell you, Peter, that on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. On this rock, I will build my church. Now, the, the name Peter means rock. And uh, so in the Catholic tradition, the, the, their interpretation is that 
Jesus is saying, on this rock, Peter, on this rock right here, I am going to build my church. And um, that's why they credit Peter to be the first pope of the Catholic Church. And you know what? The reality, that is a fair interpretation of that passage. But I also think there's an alternative interpretation. The, the statement that Peter made there is, I think, is what Jesus is saying the rock is. That statement that you just made, Peter, that I am the Messiah, the Son of God, on this rock, on that statement, I am going to build my church. Peter, Peter, little rock, I'm going to build my church on big rock, which is the fact that Jesus is the Messiah. And this whole conversation, of course, is going, taking place in front of, Okay, uh, this huge rock face of a temple. With that in the background, Jesus is talking about who he is. Uh, as I said, many people believe that in the underground, there was an underground world uh, below the water. And so it was believed that as this water was gushing out and the spring was so deep, many consider this cave right here the gate that led into hell because many people thought hell was at the bottom of that spring. And so this was re often referred to as the gates of hell. And so how interesting that Jesus would be having this conversation right in front of this area of Caesarea of Philippi. He is the cornerstone. I think when Peter goes back to the cornerstone, Peter just referred to here in Matthew, you are the rock, and, and you know, the church is going to be built on this, Jesus says. And not even the gates of hell will be able to prevent anything against it. So back in 1 Peter, that's why I think maybe he uses that term for Jesus, you are the cornerstone that the foundation of the church is going to be built on. And then he goes on to say in verse 5, you also, like living stones are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices. He's talking about this house being made of living stones. This, this verse, I think, would have caused uh, Jewish people's minds to go, what are you talking about, uh, Peter? This, this makes no sense because in the Jewish culture, of course, they were used to that there was a temple, there was a building, and God resided in the building. But now Peter is talking something completely uh, different. He's talking about that Jesus is the living stone and that the living stone and we are living stones that will build the, that's going to be built on that foundation. In fact, 1 Corinthians 3.16, uh, Paul puts it this way, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple? And so this would be a, just a, a completely different concept for this Jewish culture to be wrestling uh, through this idea. Uh, Paul is, or Peter is getting to the point now, trying to explain to the people that the church is the people. It has nothing to do with a building. Jewish culture, the temple, that was the building. That's where God resided. But now Peter is switching things up, making them realize that now he is the cornerstone. We build our lives on that cornerstone. He is the foundation. Maybe when you were a child, Growing up, you kind of did this little thing where you put your hands together and say, you know, here's the church, here's the steeple, open the doors and see all the people. Well, technically, theologically, really that's not correct because the church has is, is never been a building. The church is the people. And I know we often will say, well, hey, you want to go to church with me? I went to church. Oh, church ran over. It was late. Um, you know, we even have it on, our, on the road sign, Temple Baptist Church. And, and we understand that we're not like legalistic on that, but the, the, technically, theologically, it's not the place. It's the people. And so, as I said, th this verse is very challenging for a Jewish a culture. And then, of course, he goes on uh, to also say, that you're a, a holy uh, priesthood. Well, what does that mean? I mean, the Jewish culture knew that the Levites, that they, were, they were chosen to be priests, uh, and priests were the go-between between God and Israel. But now Peter saying, no, 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 you are part of a holy priesthood. There, there, there is no go-between. Like, you can have direct access. Uh, maybe the way that we are a go-between would be between God and the world, like we can be his spokesperson. But Peter saying, no, 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 it's no longer you go through a priest. He says, you are part of a priest, 
a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices. Again, for the Jewish culture, they're like, no, no, the priest does uh, sacrifices. They take the animal. They kill the animal. It's to be a, a part of covering our sins. But now Peter's saying, no, no, no. No, it's no longer the temple where God resides. Uh, no longer do you go through priests. No longer are sacrifices being made. No, no. You are the temple. God resides in you. You are part of now the, of the holy priesthood. You have direct access uh, to God. And you can give um, uh, spiritual sacrifices uh, to God. What is that? What is a spiritual sacrifice? I'm sure for them they're trying to figure out what does that mean? Well, Paul says in Romans chapter 20, 12, 1, I beseech you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. A living sacrifice where we lay down what we want to do to do what he wants for us to do. That's a living sacrifice. Now, the problem with living sacrifices is they're alive, which means we sometimes put ourselves on the altar as a living sacrifice, but later what we find out, the living sacrifice jumps off the altar, whereas a dead sacrifice remains there. But we are to be a living sacrifice. Now it goes on here, and it's talking about, you know, as I said, Jesus, the cornerstone, uh, the living stone. It says uh, in verse uh, 7, Now to you who believe the stone is precious, right? To us who know Jesus, yeah, of course this is precious. But to those who do not believe, that stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone that causes people to stumble, a rock that makes them fall. And Peter's actually quoting here from Isaiah. He's quoting here from uh, Psalms. And I, that phrase, a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. Why would people stumble over Jesus? They stumble over him because of who he claims to be. And, and, and he claims the fact that he is the only way to God. In our culture, I think they would accept Jesus more if he... If we would just say he is a way to God. But Jesus makes the, the claim he is the only way to God. Uh, maybe another reason that people stumble over who Jesus is is because of what he requires of us. He, he wants us to make him the Lord of our life, master of our life, that we would submit our ways to him. And we live in a culture where we're to be self-sufficient. Nobody tells me what to do. And yet Jesus requires us to make him Lord of our life. He's a stumbling block to our culture. I don't know if you ever thought about this, but do you ever notice that when people swear, they always use the name of Jesus? Seriously, have you ever heard anyone else's name used? Like, have you ever seen anyone, you know, close the car door and their fingers get stuck in the door and they go, ah, Harry Krishna, oh, ah. Or have you ever seen anyone who's doing some hammering and they're going at it and they hit it hard, they miss the nail, they get their thumb? Do you ever hear anybody go, oh, Buddha, ah, ah, Buddha, Buddha, Buddha? No. Do you ever hear anybody get frustrated and say, oh, you son of Joseph Smith? No. It always seems it's the name of Jesus. You know, sometimes on social media you'll see people uh, at the bottom of their comments, they'll say, oh, uh, OMG, oh my, right? And they take the Lord's name uh, in vain. I, I had a friend of mine that says, hey, the next time that you're tempted to put OMG, why don't you put OMM? Oh my Muhammad. See, people, when they swear, it's interesting that they take the name of Jesus. The one thing that I've, I'm learning more and more to be so real, you cannot be neutral when it comes to Jesus. I mean, the reason that Temple Baptist Church even exists is to connect people to Jesus, is to lead people into this living and growing relationship with Jesus. And Jesus, for many people, is a stumbling block for them. See, as we read our Bibles, we see everything in light of the resurrection of Jesus, as we, what we celebrated last week. We're builders. Uh, we love to build our careers and build our families and, and build our lives on something. Well, God has sent his son into the world in the person of Jesus, and he is the stone that we can build our lives on. He was rejected while he was still on earth. 
He's still being rejected, though he sits at the right hand of the Father in heaven. But it doesn't change the fact that he is the cornerstone of God's plan. Because God the Father raised him from the dead. And he is in heaven going to return one day for his children. Now, we may reject him here while on earth, but there will be a day that all of us will stand before God and give an account of our life. And some will stand before, and the question will be, why did you reject me? Why would you reject the one person who can offer meaning to your life? Why would you reject the one person who can give you direction? Why would you reject the one person who could give you purpose for living? Why would you reject the one person who offered you the forgiveness of sin? The resurrection of Jesus is a stumbling stone, and it is an unavoidable rock that stands in the pathway of each one of us. You can either climb on it and build your life on it, or you can stumble, you can trip over that stone of who Jesus is. I mean, let me just make this straight. If Jesus did not raise from the dead, Christianity is untrue, and there is absolutely no reason why we should be gathering here together. There would be nothing to salvage if Jesus did not rise from the dead. But if he did rise from the dead, he is like this massive unmovable stone that stands in our path. And you don't get rid of him by believing in something else. You don't get rid of him by saying, well, I'm glad that works for you, but I'm not the religious type. Now, that doesn't get rid of him. He still remains there as a stumbling block. You know, if I was to um, go on the Blue Water Ridge, the top part of the Blue Water Bridge with one of you, and we're looking at over the view, and it's spectacular. And uh, you say to me, well, I'm going to head home now. And so you grab the railing of the bridge, getting ready to jump over. And I'd be like, whoa, 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 what, what, what are you doing? Well, you, you're saying to me, well, I'm just going to go home. Well, what, what do you think is going to happen? I mean, what about gravity? Do you, do you think you're just going to be able to float? And, and they respond to me, well, I'm not really the gravitational type. Well, let me tell you, Jesus raised from the dead. He is an unavoidable, he is unavoidable as gravity, no matter what you believe. You may not believe gravity uh, affects you, but it doesn't mean it doesn't. It still does. You may think that, well, I can reject Jesus. It's not going to really make that big of a difference. Doesn't mean it make it true just because you uh, believe that's what's going to happen. It does matter what you believe. And this book of 1 Peter is written to Christians who really are experiencing that life is unfair, life has been very difficult, and some, I believe, would be tempted to say, I'm just going to give it all in. It seemed to be so much easier when I wasn't following Christ. And so Peter reminds this group of people what we actually have in Christ. And he uses so many descriptive words. Because he says that you are a chosen people. You're a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness. You know, as followers of Jesus, no matter how hard life gets out there, no matter what comes your way, I, I want to challenge you, don't, don't get in that mode where you pull up the drawbridge and you just um, go back into your Christian bubble. And you stand back and say, well, if that's how they're going to treat me, I, I'm not going to bother with them. No, no, no. no. That, that's not an option for us where we just retreat. In fact, when you read that, when life is hard, which the, it's extremely hard for these believers that Peter is writing to. Extremely hard. And Peter uh, says to them, declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. So Peter's saying, yeah, I know. I know life is hard. I know life is tough. I'm still telling you there's hope even when life is hard. And go ahead and declare his praises that your life has been transformed by the power of Jesus Christ. Peter's telling us, keep on witnessing. Keep on telling people the good news of Jesus Christ. Keep proclaiming how he's changed your life. You were once headed in one direction. He changed your life completely. And now you're headed for 
an eternity with Christ. Now for those who do not know a Christ this morning, I want to tell you, he is the cornerstone. He is the one that you can build your life on. He is the one that you can trust. He is the one who died for you. And he is the one who offers the forgiveness of sin. Jesus, the living stone, the cornerstone. And we can build our life on him. Let's pray. Father, this morning, I know this passage of Scripture is maybe a little more challenging than what we've had in, in, in the past. And Lord, so many word pictures for us to try to wrestle through and, and try to figure out. Lord, I pray for, for us maybe who are struggling right now as Christians. You know, maybe life is really hard right now, difficult, challenging. Maybe we have brothers and sisters right now who are struggling with, do I want to even keep on doing what I'm doing? Lord, I, I pray that you would encourage them uh, today to know that they, that they have been chosen by God, that um, they're part of God's special possession, that we're part of a royal priesthood. And, and the fact that you have called us out of darkness into this wonderful light. So Lord, some of us just need encouragement today. I pray you'd use your word to speak into the lives of believers. And then, Lord, of course, uh, we don't know who all tunes in to our services. But no doubt there would be some that are wrestling through who you are. Who is this Jesus? And uh, that question that was asked of the disciples and so many of them quickly gave all kinds of answers who people were saying that you are. And, Lord, there may be multiple answers for some people that are watching online. But, Lord, I, I would pray that you would open their eyes to, to understand Oh, who you really are. Who is this Jesus? And God, I pray that they would come to understand that you are the Messiah. You are the Son of God. That you came. You, you lived among us. You, you suffered among us. And you died for us. But Lord, like last week in what we celebrated in the Easter story, you didn't remain in that tomb. You rose again. And Lord, our lives are forever changed. And so Lord, for that, those that may be listening today, I pray that they would surrender their lives to you. I pray, Lord, they would call upon you. That's what your word says. If we call upon you, you'll hear us and you'll save us. And so Lord, do a work this morning. Transform lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you so much for your attention uh, this morning as we kind of rustle through a little bit of a more challenging passage uh, for sure. Uh, hopefully, we're praying, Lord willing, next week we'll be able to gather uh, together again. We also understand there'll still be people joining us online. We're so grateful for technology and the ability to be able to come into your home or your business or uh, wherever you may be watching uh, today. I close with this. Because we know that Jesus Christ is the cornerstone, because we know we can build our life on that, he's the living stone, the cornerstone. We close with this. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling. We just talked about that, that Jesus is a stumbling block for some. But now we're told, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence, imagine standing before God's presence without fault <laughs> no pointing fingers he says to stand before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy to the only God our Savior the only way to God Jesus right to the only God our Savior be glory majesty power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages now and forevermore amen and amen Thank you so much for joining us. We look forward to being together again next weekend.